Welcome to lesson four, which I've titled An Eternal Focus. Jesus is meeting with his disciples on the edge of the Sea of Galilee on the Mount of Beatitudes. He's seated, his disciples are standing nearby. In addition, many other people, because the Bible talks about the crowds, have crowded in and come closer because they want to hear what this man Jesus is teaching. He begins by talking about the life God wants us to live, a life that God is able to bless. From there, he talks about the fact that God wants to be our king. He wants to live with us in a close personal relationship, helping to guide our lives, making the right choices so that he can continue to pour his blessing into our lives and into this earthly walk. It was never promised that it would be easy. Instead, truthfully, scripture promises that the life of a disciple will actually be persecuted at times. But all of it is for God's glory. We're persecuted for the sake of righteousness, the sake of the gospel. That's the life of a disciple. Today, Jesus is going to teach his disciples what it means to live with eternity in mind, to walk through life on earth knowing this is the road trip, not the destination. And so Jesus will teach what we need to know in order to focus our lives on eternal things, matters that will matter forever. And so he begins by telling his disciples, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy. He's been saying, this is what you need to do. Now he says, but do not focus on things of this world because they're temporary, because things in this world can come in and destroy what God wants for your life. We can put a lot of investment in the things we own here on earth, but as the old saying goes, there's no U-Haul attached to a hearse. We don't take it with us. What do we take with us to heaven? What are those rewards that will last eternally? He says in verse 20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Everything we do that stores treasure in heaven that will be rewarded in heaven, all of those things are protected in heaven. They will last forever because nothing can remove them. We often are led by our own sense of self sometimes to do those things that bring us attention or reward here on earth. And Jesus would say, that's all the reward there is. Instead, he said, I want you to focus on the rewards that are eternal. They're forever. They're protected for you in heaven. Nothing can take them away. He said, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If we focus on eternal reward, if our priorities are those things that are rewarded eternally, then our hearts will go that direction. And by heart, Jesus is saying your motivation will be things eternal. In the first century, they thought the heart was the motivator. They knew it drove a person's life. But they also knew that it was their passions. Their heart raced when they were passionate about something. So Jesus is saying where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you want to save up permanent reward, then that will be the passions that motivate this life. And then he talks about one of the ways that we perceive this world. In verse 
22, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. We have to think of this in first century mindset. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In the first century, babies were born without all the benefits, medical benefits we have today. There are drops that are put into the eyes of a newborn baby who has just passed through the birth canal in order to protect what might have infected their eyes. They didn't have that in the first century. And many of the first century babies had eye issues from the beginning of their life. If they had nearsightedness or farsightedness, what they perceived was all they knew because they didn't have glasses that could fix that. That's why Jesus is saying, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light, of truth. You will see things accurately. If instead your eyes are not healthy, you don't really perceive things accurately. Jesus is saying that what we bring into our lives, what we see, what we're focused on in this world will either be on the truth, which is light, or it'll be darkness, simply because we perceive that as being important or right. And if we let in truth that isn't truth, how great is that darkness? If we're focused on priorities that aren't forever, how will that alter the light in our lives of God's word and God's priorities? And it's never a wrong thing to realize that what our eyes are focused on in this world will control our choices and the way we think. And in our culture today, through media, computer screens, TVs, movies, all of us would admit we're letting in probably more darkness than the Lord would want us to. And how great is that darkness if it changes who God wants us to be, if it changes the reward in our life that will be forever. He then goes on in verse 24 to make an important statement. He says, no one can serve two masters. In the original language, this referred to two slaves that could only have one master. They were literally the slaves that were owned by another human being. And they could only be owned by one. What Jesus is saying is that we're all enslaved to something. We're all enslaved to a master. He says, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot make God happy and please Satan at the same time. We cannot live for the things of this world and have God's priorities. We are all serving a master. At any given moment, we're being led one way or the other. And Jesus would say, understand that only God should be controlling your priorities, your choices, your decisions. He then goes on to make another statement. Jesus spoke about money more than almost anything else. And he said, you cannot serve both God and money. I think Jesus knew that money would be one of the most controlling factors in our lives. We're taught to be careful with money and take good care of our money 
so that we have money to give, we have money to live on, so that we can live responsibly. Jesus would encourage that. At the same time, if your definition of enough is just a little more, then won't that control the priority that you give money in your life? That's what Jesus is saying here. No one can serve two masters. We either serve God and his choices for our life or we serve our own or someone else's influence. And so in verse 25, he says, therefore, therefore, because we can't serve both God and the world's priorities, Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. He's talking about your earthly life. Do not worry about your life. What will you eat or drink or about your body? What will you wear? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? I love this statement out of the Sermon on the Mount because I'm a worrier by nature. And Jesus leans down to his disciples and he said, Don't worry. Don't worry about all of these things that control your daily choices. You've got food, you're good. You've got clothes, you're good. I wonder what he would say to our culture today. We don't worry if we have clothes. We worry if we have the newest of clothes or the most fashionable clothes. There's even people that worry about the name that's displayed on their clothes. What so controls your own sense of self that it causes you to worry if for some reason you don't have it? I've never gone hungry a day in my life. And I don't know what it would mean, what these verses would mean if I was worried about that. But I hope that I would hear Jesus say the same thing to me today that he said to his disciples. Don't let your life be concerned about things that don't matter forever. Why? It's in the next verses. Jesus said, look at the birds. I picture him on the Sea of Galilee. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. There are always birds because there are always fishermen. I can see Jesus waving his arm and looking out across the water and saying, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he looks at his disciples and says, Are you not much more valuable than they are? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, don't worry, God adores you. He loves you. God will take care of you. And worrying won't change what God does for you. It'll only change the way you spend your time, the way you spend your energy. And honestly, if I could go back and erase anything in my past, it would be that one thing. I wish I hadn't worried about so many things that didn't matter ever because I spent too much time and energy and wonder, what did I miss doing because I was worried 
about something else. There's grace, but I think with this word of God, there's also accountability. I liked Maya Angelou's statement that says, you know, when you know better, you do better. I'm listening to Jesus' words, and I want to say, Lord, I hear you. I know better. Now I want to do better. He goes on to talk about worry some more. In verse 28, he says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Jesus is preaching this sermon probably in the springtime, and the fields around him would have been covered with flowers. He says, yet I tell you, don't worry. I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Poppies grew wild next to the Sea of Galilee. They still do. They're beautiful. Jesus said, Look at what God can do. Even Solomon with all of his money, all of his splendor, all of his power and authority couldn't compare to what we see right here. It's a good thing to focus on those things that only God can create. It's amazing to look at a sunset and realize that's among the most beautiful things we can ever put our eyes on. And only God can do that. If he's going to create that here on earth, what will he do in our lives the, for the people he loves? So in verse 31, Jesus says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. There's a powerful comment in there. I wonder how much worry about our lives damages our witness. If people saw in our lives contentment, peace, satisfaction, joy, and absolute trust that God would provide, would that not preach the loudest of sermons about the greatness of God? So do not worry. Preach your faith instead. Jesus said that we are to have an eternal focus on this earthly life. But what brings that to us? It's in his next words. Verse 33, a very famous verse. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first God's kingdom. What does God care about? What does God, as your king, want you to think about? Spend your time doing. Spend your passions on. Spend your money on. What does God, as your king, want you to feel and know and trust? Those are the things that will earn you reward in heaven, that will cause your focus to be on the things that God most cares about, and therefore your life will produce treasure, maybe not here on earth, but definitely in heaven. Seek first his kingdom. Seek righteousness. Seek what it takes to be right with God. 
and then everything else on this planet Earth, everything else in your earthly life falls into place with those priorities. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't even exist. It's a word until we wake up tomorrow morning. Tomorrow is just a word. It's real only when we get there. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And today, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. This is the way Jesus taught us to live as his disciples. This is the way Jesus taught us to live so that our earthly lives would matter forever. Not just for us, but to all the people that our lives will influence and minister to. So, how would God have us alter our priorities today? How would God ask us to examine our hearts? What do we need to do to be right with God so that we can be right with those around us? And so that our day is spent storing treasure in heaven instead of worrying about the stuff on this earth that's only temporary anyway. Jesus wanted us to live that kind of life. Ezra Benson has a great quote, and I close with this. He said, when we put God first, all other things fall into their proper place or drop out of our lives. Our love of the Lord will govern the claims for our affection, the demands on our time, the interests we pursue, and the order of our priorities. In a nutshell, that says what Jesus was teaching his disciples in the verses we learned today. Spend some time and let that sink into your life. Wouldn't it be great to be able to live without all these things we worry about? If they don't matter forever, they don't matter very much. See you next time.